Well, good morning, everybody. Today is Friday, June 5th, and welcome to the Miller Johnson uh, COVID-19 response team uh, daily webinar. My name is Sandy Andre, and I am joined this morning um, by my friend and colleague, Mary Taven. We are attorneys in the firm's employment section, and today we're going to be um, doing a bit of a uh, dive into Executive Order 110 um, and talking a little bit about some of the misconceptions um, that um, some of our clients have been having as it relates to the order, um, what it means for their workplaces, and actually what it means um, for, uh, for their social lives too. So we'll be hitting on all of those pieces. Uh, but before we dive into some of that content, I just want to share a couple of pieces um, of updated uh, COVID-19 related news. So a bit of good news this morning that we learned that Michigan's seven day moving average for confirmed cases has dropped to 318 and that is the lowest since March 22nd. Um, so that is a, a bit of good news. Another piece of good news, um, epidemiologists and vaccine um, experts have learned that the coronavirus does not appear to be mutating, um, which is very good news, obviously, for vaccine efforts. However, of course, we know that the risk for transmission remains high. Um, and our virus statistics um, are, are still heavy, right? So in the United States, um, almost 2 million people have had confirmed cases, and we're over 100,000 deaths here in the state. In Michigan, um, we are over 58,000 confirmed cases and over 5,500 deaths. So we certainly are not uh, through this difficult time, um, but with pieces of good news um, about um, uh, what we're doing to, to mitigate the spread um, is welcome. So let's go ahead and jump into our topic this morning. So we'll first start this morning um, with just a brief overview of Executive Order uh, 110, and then we're going to kind of jump into a question and answer type of format regarding specific questions uh, we have received since Monday. Um, we were just talking with the group, um, and I was reminded that this was just issued this last Monday, and it seems um, it all seems like a whirlwind, and so trying to keep all of the pieces straight can be difficult, and we recognize that, and so that's why we want to spend um, a little bit of time talking about some of the specific nuts and bolts, but applying those pieces specifically to questions that we've already received from you, and so that's that's important to us to, to, to meet you there. Next slide, please. So first, let's talk about um, the, the nuts and bolts a little bit of the executive order itself. So if you remember, you know, our previous um, stay home, stay safe orders um, were titled um, in different ways, talking about um, uh, temporary requirements to suspend certain activities that weren't necessary to sustain or protect life. This order is titled a little bit differently, and, and it's kind of a hint um, of some of the things that are a little bit different. So Executive Order 110 issued this last Monday and became effective immediately June 1st. However, it does have some staggered um, uh, uh, restriction um, lifting dates, and we'll talk about those in just a second. But what's really important to remember about 110 is um, that it rescinded Executive Order 69, which was the public accommodation restriction executive order, and it rescinded Executive Order 96, which was the previous uh, stay home, stay safe order. Okay, and so as we look at um, how we think about uh, this particular order, we remember that 69 and 96 have gone away. Um, and so to the extent that they were kind of shaping what we thought some of the pieces in 110 mean, it's important to kind of keep that in the back of your head. Um, but just quickly going back to the title, temporary restrictions on certain events, gatherings, and businesses. So if we look at previous uh, stay home, stay safe orders, right? It was you're not allowed to be gone from home 
unless it's for these very explicit things, okay? Now with 110, it's you are able to leave your home unless it's for one of these things and you can't, right? So you're allowed to leave home with some um, restrictions and, and mitigation strategies, those types of pieces, unless it's specifically indicated that you can't. So it's, it's flipped. Instead of saying, I have to go to the order to see what I can do, it's now almost, I need to go to the order to see what I am not allowed to do or how I am allowed to do the things I can do. So maybe that's a little bit confusing, but I think it, it's worth spending a little bit of time on that and kind of just um, making that flip in all of our, our own brains, um, uh, mine included for sure. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, this was signed on Monday, went into effect immediately, but did have some staggered types of opening dates, and we'll get into the nuts and bolts of each of these pieces, um, but we've hit a, a couple of milestones here and have a couple on the horizon. So the first was yesterday that retailers were allowed to open um, subject to some um, limitations, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but this coming Monday, we hit another milestone, right? So um, that's when we can look to restaurants and bars outdoor public swimming pools, day camps, libraries, and museums, to, to name a few. Those are permitted to open starting on Monday, okay? So those are all explicitly listed there. However, what is also explicitly listed are a handful of establishments that must remain closed, okay? So when, when we hear in the media that the, the stay-at-home order has been lifted, we have to think about what, what that means. Um, because it doesn't mean that we go back to what life looked like uh, before, uh, you know, uh, March, uh, March 10th, right? So um, we still have some limitations in place. And so places like indoor theaters, uh, cinemas, performance venues, indoor gyms, fitness centers, um, exercise facilities, personal care facilities like salons, um, hair and nail salons, uh, tattoo parlors, massage, all of those pieces, those remain closed and casinos remain closed, okay? So those are uh, continuing to be explicitly uh, listed there in the order as places that must remain closed. Okay, next slide, please. So now let's go ahead and go into kind of this question and answer format that is based on um, some of the uh, questions that we've received um, about, about this specific order. And this is, is the biggest one. So question number one, kind of what does lifted mean, right? The media says the stay at home order has been lifted. That means everything goes back to normal, right? Uh, so unfortunately the answer to that is lifted does not mean normal. So Again, remember we just talked about kind of flipping the way that we think about this order. So the, the initial order said you must stay home unless you're doing one of these specific things. Now the order says you don't have to stay home unless it's for one of these things, then you, then you can't resume those. So when we talk about the stay at home order being lifted, um, in some ways that's true, right? Because if you um, take a look at our um, my Safe Start plan um, from the governor's office here. Um, she announced right on Monday that the whole state is able to move into this phase four, which phase four is improving. And so you can see where it says, what do we need to do to stay safe? We've moved from stay home, stay safe, to safer at home, and now it's still in phase four, we are safer at home. So we don't have to stay home, we're still safer at home, save for um, some of the things that we are uh, now permitted to do in the way that we're allowed to do them, okay? So it's important for us to understand kind of in this six phase type of cycle, what, what that means and what that what that looks like. So if, if you've been thinking about 110 being lifted or the stay at home order being lifted, meaning we're through it, you can see that this is six phases and we're at four. So we're not at the end, um, meaning that 
um, all of the mitigation pieces that we've been doing in the past kind of just go away and are no longer applicable. It's just a, a loosening um, of, of when we have to stay home. So as we look close at stage four, we know that that means continued distancing, face coverings, safe additional work practices, and we know that lower risk businesses with strict safety measures were allowed to come back online. So you can see there it says other retail with capacity limits um, and offices, but with telework required. Um, so we'll hit on that piece a little bit um, a little bit later, but uh, spending a little bit of time here on this visual I think is helpful. So again, we're at stage four of six. And so all of the stage four things kind of apply to us. And we can see in terms of the progression, how we've moved from three to four, all of those pieces. And so um, hopefully as long as we continue to move forward, phase five is in our future and we can see what some of those uh, loosenings will look like at that time as well. Okay, so let's go ahead and go to our next question. Question two, regions. What about the regions? If the entire state has been opened back up, do the regions still matter? Um, and the answer to that is yes, the regions do still matter. And we'll talk about why. So um, before we get into that, let's just a refresher. Um, for those of you who don't have this map memorized, uh, shame on you. <laughs> it helps me learn all of the counties in Michigan, right? So, so if you remember um, when uh, the My Safe Start plan came online, uh, the governor's office broke the state of Michigan into eight regions. And at that time, um, wanted to be looking at uh, public health data um, and disease information um, out of each of those reasons to determine how and when and at what pace um, activities um, and businesses in those particular regions could move through uh, the Safe Start plan. So if we remember, um, right a couple of weeks ago, uh, right before the Memorial Day holiday, we received word that region six and eight, so we're talking about the Upper Peninsula region and the Traverse City region, um, they were moved into phase four before the rest of the state, right? So they were able to um, have some retail um, open back up, um, some of the social gatherings, um, some of those limits um, uh, in terms of capacity, capacity limits were increased, some of those pieces, and then the rest of us um, caught, caught back up. But the, re the reason the regions still matter, uh, next slide please, is again, um, going back to the My Safe Start plan. So if you see at the very bottom, although we only want to think about moving forward, we also can be moving backward. So in the event that as some of these loosenings, right, start to um, have maybe negative effects or if, if there are hot spots in certain regions, it's certainly possible, right, that the governor's office would say, okay, um, you know, the, the state's at stage four, but we're seeing spikes in these particular regions. So perhaps it makes sense to move certain regions backwards. Okay, um, this is just conjecture on my part. We certainly haven't um, heard heard that of that being um, on the table at any point, but it, it's certainly still possible because again, we're not we're not post pandemic here. But again, as a reminder, we're all still at four stage four, so we still have five and six to go. So it's certainly um, possible that regions move forward into five and six at different paces, and in fact. Um, while we were putting the webinar together um, this week, I was reminded that in the governor's press conference um, releasing Executive Order 110 this last Monday, she had mentioned um, hopes to move uh, Region 6 and 8, so again, the UP and the Traverse City region, to Phase 5, um, you know, within a relatively short time period, maybe even yet this week. So here we are on Friday. Um, maybe that's something that will happen today, maybe not, I don't know. But again, that's why the regions, um, the region concept remains important because it certainly seems like um, there's still an inclination um, to, to think about a regional approach and evaluate the data in those regions to determine how and when um, folks can go forward, but also remembering that we can go backward and that certainly could happen in a regional approach as well. 
Okay, let's move on to our next question. And this question is regarding duration. So I've lost track of all the expiration dates. Um, this order expires on June 12th, right? So this is a fantastic question. And um, I, I have joked thinking, I'd say, I don't understand why people are confused, but that would just be a lie because this is very difficult to keep straight. So let's just quickly um, take a look at a couple of important dates to help us figure out how we've gotten here and what dates remain important. So remember that Executive Order 110 rescinded Executive Order 69 and 96. So if we look back at 69, that original expiration um, was May 28th, um, as well as Executive Order 96, May 28th. So obviously we're, we're well past those dates. So, so those have gone away. So May 28th, I mean, and obviously we are past that date. So that's been off the table for some time anyway. Um, but so, so those can, you can kind of erase those from your brain. Um, but if you remember, right um, over the Memorial Day holiday, there was a handful of ex executive orders that came out um, that didn't necessarily implicate the stay home, stay safe order in terms of um, different things coming back online or uh, some social uh, distancing things being loosened, but they specifically dealt with um, the declaration of the state of emergency and this one executive order 100 amending the duration of various um, specific executive orders. So let's look at executive order 99. So executive order 99, indicates that it expires declaration of the state of emergency on June 19th at 1159 p.m. And in that order, the governor indicates um, that she is making her declaration of the state of emergency based on her powers under two separate laws, the Emergency Powers of the Governor Act and the Emergency Management Act. Um, so that just seems like a little bit of administrative law. Maybe that's not particularly important, but the mention of both of those laws um, is important um, to, to help us figure out what's going on here. Um, so state of emergency goes until June 19th. So Executive Order 100 then says, um, specifically changed uh, the expiration dates of 96 and 69 to June 12th, right? So as soon as 100 came out, we knew um, the stay at home, the, the old, right, stay home, stay safe order was extended till June 12th. But now we've got this declaration of state of emergency. And so if we go to the next slide, um, it's that declaration of the state of emergency um, that 110 is hinged on. Okay. So, so yes we're looking um, at a June 19th type of date. However, if, if any of us have been walking around for the last three months, right, in some ways we know that some of these dates um, are certainly um, flexible and changing, okay? So, um, and there's certainly been a, a number of hints in the media um, that, uh, you know, we're not, you know, as, as the governor likes to say, we, we talk about turning a dial and not flipping a switch. So it's, it's perfectly appropriate for us to assume we won't be flipping that switch on June 19th, but rather between now and then taking some additional steps um, and even after that date continuing in this process. So I just pulled um, a couple of quotes here. Two, um, two are from uh, media reports, and that last bullet point is, is specifically from the press release um, from the governor's office discussing Executive Order 110. So in each of these, we're talking about the 4th of July. And I'm not good at math, <laughs> but I certainly know that July 4th comes after June 19th. So if we're talking about, uh, you know, we hope to, to be, you know, in this certain place on July 4th, um, that certainly is a big hint um, that some of these restrictions are going to remain after June 19th. So for now, let's keep our eye on June 19th, but with knowing that um, some of these pieces will likely extend uh, beyond, beyond that date, just so we're not all surprised by that. Okay, next slide, please. So now let's talk about in-person work. So um, this question is, uh, the next two questions are really big misconceptions here. So the first one is, okay, so, so I keep hearing in the media that, that the order is lifted. So 
um, but I still remember all the work we had to do, right, regarding designating our staff as critical infrastructure, minimum business operations, or resumed activities, right, issuing people letters and, and all of those pieces. So must we still limit in-person work to only those who are part of the critical infrastructure, minimum business operation, or resumed activities? And so the answer to that, this is a bit of good news. Remember, if we start to think about 110 as being, um, you can do all the things except the ones that are listed here. The answer here is, unless it is explicitly prohibited, employees may return. So um, remember 96 um, and its predecessors um, are where we got this critical infrastructure, minimum basic operations, resumed activity type of language, okay? So we remember those orders said, hey, um, no person can operate a business or require employees to leave their home unless it is to perform one of these activities. But remember, 110 rescinded 96, so that thought goes away. Uh, next slide, please. And if we look at some of this specific language, we can see, remember in the beginning we talked about um, the way we need to think about 110 is kind of flipped compared to the previous ones. We find that right in the language. So I'm um, just going to read it here. Uh, with this order, I find it reasonable and necessary to move the state to stage four of the Michigan Safe Start Plan. So we've talked about that, but this next piece is important. As a result, Michiganders are no longer required to stay home. Instead, certain businesses will remain closed and specific activities that present a heightened risk of infection will remain prohibited, right? So again, we've kind of flipped. Instead of saying these are the only things you can do, the flip is now here are the things that are still not allowed, okay? So, so the answer to the original question, must we still limit in-person work to those who are part of critical infrastructure, minimum business operation, or resumed activities? The answer to that is no, no. And um, there were certain industries, um, right, that could only be supplying uh, goods um, or services to folks who were critical infrastructure workers or minimum business um, operations folks, right? The work that they were doing had to be specifically linked to, to one of those, to serving folks in those capacities too. So all of that is gone, right? So one of the things as an example, the um, specific question we've gotten this week is about uh, daycare, right? So if we remember daycares, um, previous to 110 were required, um, were permitted to stay open, but only to the extent that they were um, providing care um, for kiddos whose caregivers fell in one of those three buckets, right? So, so there was a little bit of work some of those daycares needed to be doing to say, okay, hey parents, do you fall into one of these three buckets? Because um, that's all, all we're allowed to service at this point. So that has been lifted and that has gone away. But a big, a big but here, right? So question number five. Um, so, okay, Sandy, unless this specifically prohibited, we all get to come back. So great, everyone comes back, right? Um, so next slide here. Um, and so this is how I know I'm really missing sports, right? So the first time I got that question is the first thought that popped into my head was this response, um, you know, not so fast, my friend, right? So at least we still have sports gifts and memes, and that's kind of keeping us going. But uh, sadly, right, that is, uh, that is the answer is uh, not so fast, my friend. Remote work is still the rule. So 110, any work that is capable of being performed remotely must be performed remotely. And in section two, any work that is capable of being performed remotely, i.e. without the worker leaving his or her home or place of residence must be performed remotely. So I know that that seems very repetitive, but both of those sentences are exactly from 110. So I make the point to say, um, the governor took the time to say that explicitly exactly that way twice, two times in executive order 110. So it is clear um, that remote work is still the rule. And so again, um, I, 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 I don't mean this in a negative way, but as we kind of look at how 110 is being played in the media, again, we go back to this word lifting, and, and in some ways I think that's true, right? Stay at home is lifted, but that doesn't mean all of, all of the parameters and the mitigation requirements um, 
that those have been lifted. There are some things that are still in place. And again, if we go back, right, we look at our My Safe Start plan, you guys are going to uh, get really sick of me going back to that pictorial, and I won't do it now, but it is a really handy tool to kind of keep in mind right in that plan, right, for stage four, offices can reopen, but telework is required if possible. So we've moved away from language that says, you know, to the maximum extent necessary, should be encouraged, so on and so forth. Now we've got it multiple times saying must, must. So any work that's capable of being performed remotely must be performed. And where this is tricky, right? So here we are sitting on uh, June 5th. Um, for those of us who have been um, doing remote work, yours truly raising my hand here, um, since sometime in March, um, we, we've been doing it this whole time. And so um, certainly there are circumstances in your own business or operation that says, hey, um, you know, we we could have, uh, you know, Sandy or whoever the remote worker is performing her work remotely um, for the last several weeks because this is what the situation looks like in our organization. Um, but today that situation is different and here's all the reasons that remote work is no longer possible for her. That That is, that is uh, perfectly appropriate. Doesn't mean that every single person who's been working remotely since the beginning of all this must remain at work. However, what it does mean is that any um, change, right? So if, if somebody has been performing their work uh, remotely for this entire time, you're going to need to justify having them um, back in uh, in your office or in your facility for in-person work. It's going to be very specific to your business needs, that person's job. It cannot be a blanket, hey, we want to bring everybody um, you know, back because we want to, it's got to be very specific to um, an employee specific situation. Um, so that is really important. If you keep in the back of your head that remote work is still the rule, not the exception, um, that'll really help you think about what you need in this analysis in, in the correct way, because it's really um, work that's possible to be performed remotely. It would be the exception um, for that to be permitted to be back um, happening within the facility and would be a, a pretty um, case specific kind of a fact, um, fact intensive type of analysis. So, so I hate to end uh, my section on, on that little bit of kind of a downer, um, but, but those are a couple of important nuggets. So if we go to the next slide, and I will go ahead and toss it over to Mary. Thank you, Sandy. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I am going to talk about the rest of the questions we have here that have been pretty common uh, since Executive Order 110 has been issued. But um, I do want to take a moment to address just a few questions that we've had. Uh, one of the questions is, can we require folks to return to work? So. Um, and are we required to hold their position if they do not return to work? So that question is a very um, common yet complicated question because there's lots of laws other than these executive orders that you will want to consider. So as Sandy was talking about, this executive order has flipped. Um, it said that we employers are allowed to um, have employees return to work, except regarding the exceptions that we talked about and certainly the remote work. But there are also executive orders that are still in play. You may remember uh, Executive Order 36 that talks about um, if folks are close contact with someone that had COVID-19, has COVID-19, or exhibit symptoms, that is still an exception for an employee not to return to work. Additionally, if they have medical issues that are heightened regarding COVID-19, those are, that is another reason why an employee um, cannot be required to return to work. So, uh, there are different employment laws and executive orders that you will still want to consider. So those 
uh, that question is still, the answer is going to vary depending on the specific uh, fact. And then another question we had are, what are the consequences of not following the remote work mandate? So as Sandy just went through uh, this, certainly there are a lot of areas in these executive orders that are gray, that are subject to interpretation and debate, but uh, there are certain areas in executive orders that are pretty uh, unequivocally clear. And so this by far is her clearest mandate regarding remote work. And so in previous orders, we had seen the word promote and encourage, and this order says uh, must, as Sandy had mentioned. So the consequences, uh, again, are a few executive orders ago, I can't remember which um, one, these executive order violations for employers used to be a misdemeanor, a crime, and although nobody wants to, especially a corporate entity wants to commit a crime, uh, it was a foreign concept, and um, um, even though it was there, it was not something that was looming over our, our corporate head so much. But in a relatively recent executive order, she had changed that to not only um, there's no longer any criminal penalty, but OSHA is overseeing uh, violations and complaints. And so violations has the full effect of penalties regarding OSHA, which of course our employees are very familiar with OSHA. OSHA has been governing employers for years regarding safety. And so, uh, employees are used to contacting OSHA and of course OSHA issues and penalties can be severe from not only fines but losing license, uh, shutting down operations and posting requirements. And if you all have dealt with OSHA before, they can be pretty um, hard to move from what they think is the proper remedy. So. Uh, violations regarding this um, can still be severe and you want to remember that even though the, these executive orders are relaxing and you may be hearing uh, from folks that uh, that is a good thing and you may be hearing from folks that they even want it to be relaxed more just because somebody is speaking the loudest may not mean that is representative of what all of your employees are thinking or all of your customers. And so uh, for violations, um, complaints can come from many different forms, whether it's your employees, whether it's your customers, whether it's the community. So you want to keep in mind that these executive orders are issuing the law and the law is a floor, not a ceiling. So those are the bare minimum expectations that employers will have to meet. And so because there are different viewpoints from your employees and folks, you do want to follow these orders regardless of how you personally feel about them to the best of your ability. So now we're gonna jump back in to the questions. So one other really good question that we have been receiving is, with the stay at home order being lifted and all of the media hype regarding using the word lifted and things are, are they're implying getting back to normal. And as Sandy said, just because it's lifted does not mean normal. Are health, health screens still required? Is a COVID-19 preparedness plan that we've been talking about still necessary? Do we still need to continue to purchase sanitization issues, and of course, we have lots of employees that do not particularly like wearing masks, and so do we still need to offer and require our employees to wear masks? So the answer to that, next slide please, is that um, all of the safety measures that were introduced and that we have been used to since Executive Order 97, now remember, uh, back, and I think it was May 21st, uh, the governor came out with Executive Order 97 and 96. As Sandy said, 96 has been rescinded, 
but 97 clearly has been maintained. In fact, in section three of this executive order 110, and I'll just read from the order, uh, the governor stated any business or operation that requires its employees to leave their home or place of residence for work is subject to the rules on workplace safeguards in executive order 97 or any order that may follow from it. So all of the requirements regarding executive, nine, executive order 97 are still in play. You may remember a few weeks ago, Sandy and I did a webinar on Executive Order 97. So um, we're not going to deep dive into the details of this, but a summary of some of the requirements are still appropriate because 97, as you may remember, was a doozy. Uh, it had a whole host of safeguard protections that uh, needed to be in place uh, immediately or had some quick turnaround. So, um, I try to view Executive Order 97 as the direction. If we're going to operate as a business and uh, if we are open and allowed to have our employees work, we need to follow these instructions in order to comply with the law. So uh, there were nine sections in that order that uh, talked about various different industries. Um, but there was a catch-all, uh, and that was in Section 1, and that catch-all is uh, a requirement for all businesses, regardless of industry. So Section 1, and I'll go through some highlights again just as a refresher for uh, companies that are still operating or those that may just now start operating uh, to a fuller extent um what those requirements are so section one applies to all businesses so if you do have executive order 97 you do want to make sure that regardless of what industry you are that you are adhering to section one and of course um, the other sections were industry specific section two had additional requirements for outdoor work section three even more requirements for construction section four in addition to section one, um, if you are a manufacturer, research lab, retail store offices, restaurant or outpatient healthcare facilities, you had additional requirements that you needed to meet to safeguard uh, your workers. Next slide, please. And so let's talk about section one, since that applied to all of our uh, to everyone, every business in Michigan, regardless of industry. Some of the highlights, highlights are, remember uh, COVID-19 preparedness and response plan. If you do not have one, uh, that was required by June 1st, and or if you're just coming online with this new executive order as a business, you are required to have one within two weeks of you being able to operate again. And this preparedness and response plan is your guide and your guide to essentially train your supervisors on what sort of measures that your business itself has have taken to minimize the COVID-19 spread, to sanitize, to social distance, uh, to what kind of protocol you're going to follow if there's a COVID-19 positive in your establishment. Um, it also identifies who your work um, workplace coordinator is that employees can go to if they have a question regarding uh, the safe work environment. So although it is a very lengthy document, it is a document that's very important and um, required. Some of us have had it for a long time now because this uh, COVID-19 preparedness and response plan has been for a while, but with Executive Order 97, the governor applied it uh, to all industry or to all businesses across all industries. The other thing that you wanna remember is that you do need to designate a worksite supervisor uh, that is on site at all times if you have an employee working that um, an employee can go to uh, regarding um, sanitization and COVID-19 issues. 
the question we have and continue to have a lot on worksite supervisor is what if we only have one employee working? Um, the executive order does state that it does not, despite the title, it does not have to be a supervisor, it doesn't have to be a manager, it can be an employee. So if you have an employee that works by itself, you can designate that employee as their own worksite supervisor, regardless of um, the, the reasonableness of, of that, that is something that um, is clear that you can do. And of course, COVID-19 training is still required. You'll wanna to go to Executive Order 97 to, to see what the specific requirements are regarding that. And that training does not have to be in person. It does not have to be a video, although it certainly can. Um, it can be handouts, however you believe your training can, can surface uh, or is most effective with your employees. The daily entry self-screening, those health uh, attestations are still required. Um, and if you're in a manufacturing or other facilities, of course, you have some heightened screening measures. Uh, the six foot distancing rule is a still requirement for, for us that are operating businesses. We still need to provide non-medical grade face coverings for our employees. And we still must require face coverings to be worn by our employees when the six foot rule cannot constantly be maintained between employees. And we need to encourage face shields if there is um, contact within three feet of each other. A few more section one highlights. Next slide, please. Is that uh, we still need to do increased facility cleaning and that's gonna be a requirement that's gonna be around for a, a long time. Uh, we need to make sure cleaning supplies are available to employees upon entry at the work site, not necessarily just at their their office or their machine or their workstation, but upon entry. And uh, employers still need to have a positive COVID-19 case protocol. So one little nuance there that you wanna make sure that you're complying with is a week or so ago, uh, made it clear that when you were looking at the COVID-19 case protocol, and this remember is where you have a COVID-19 positive and you need to determine what employees you need to quarantine and um, who are the ones that you need to notify that there is a COVID-19. You also have to go through an analysis, um, I call it an OSHA analysis, to determine if the employee uh, received or was contracted the COVID-19 um, virus in your facility. And there are certain questions that you need to ask the employee regarding that, because if it is determined that the employee did contract the virus at your facility, um, it is now a requirement that you need to report it to OSHA as a respiratory illness that was received there. So that is um, an OSHA issue that some employers um, continue to try to, or continue to overlook um, for good reason, right? These things are rapidly changing still um, and you're getting all these different requirements from a lot of different sources. So just wanted to put a reminder there regarding that OSHA requirement. And then of course, restrict business related travel for employees to essential travel only. Next slide. So then uh, last but last least regarding section um, one of executive order 96, we still need to encourage employees to use um, certain safety measures on public transportation. And here, remember in 97, it says promote work, remote work to the fullest extent possible. Um, we read that now as a requirement based on executive order 110. Um, and then adopt any in additional infection control measures regarding your building. Next slide. So Executive Order 97 though, although we talk a lot about it, is still not a one-stop shop for all in-person work requirements. So if your business falls into one of these categories, uh, you'll want to look at those executive orders 
for additional requirements for your industry because those all those executive orders are still in play. Uh, next slide. And the same thing goes for employee protections. Although 97 is largely known as this is our our instruction manual to protect our employees. If we comply with 97, we're good. Uh, that is not necessarily true here. So um, Executive Order 97 is not a one-stop shop for all employee protections. You'll want to remember, uh, especially if you have less than 500 employees, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act is still in play, and um, that is where employees can have be on a, a leave of absence or have certain protections because of COVID-19 related reasons. And then, of course, Executive Order, Order 36 that I briefly mentioned before, uh, where um, it's public policy here in Michigan that if you have been in close contact with somebody that has COVID-19, has symptoms of COVID-19, you have COVID-19 or you have primary symptoms of COVID-19 that you should not uh, be at work. And another uh, little hidden gem here is that you want to remember to check your local public health orders. So um, in Michigan and in other states, not only are executive orders uh, being issued in changing public health orders and local ones for various counties are rapidly being issued and changing as well. So you'll want to check those for additional requirements. Next slide. Okay, so that was a long-winded answer to that first question. We'll be gaining speed here regarding the rest of the questions here. So question number seven, retail. So um, this Executive Order 110 is, um, I don't want to be oversimplifying things, but for those employers that have still been or have been operating as a critical infrastructure or um, have had specific exemptions from the very be very beginning, this order is really a whole lot of nothing. It doesn't change um, a lot. And even for offices and things with, that are allowed to do remote work, just like uh, Miller Johnson, this order did not change anything either. So those businesses that are more service industry that were required to do remote work um, or could do remote work are still required to do so. But there are a few exceptions to that. And one is retail. Um, the question we get is, you know, am I still need, do I still need an appointment to shop, which was very depressing to most of us. So um, the good news is, next slide, is that we no longer need um, an appointment to go shopping. So we're almost back to normal with with shopping because we don't need to make it a, a requirement to go to Michael's or Joann's to get our favorite craft, but um, it's still not normal. So they retail operations can resume uh, op even though they say normal op operations, they still have a lot of requirements. Of course, local regulations, but uh, 97, again, still follows. And remember the slide a few slides ago where there were uh, the section one, which applies to all uh, businesses, and there were different sections that applied to uh, different industries. There, section six is a retail store requirement, and I'm going to go through these very quickly because most of these we've seen at our local grocery store already because they're very analogous to the retail store requirements. Um, but if you're a retail store, you still need to communicate um, to your customers regarding your changes uh, that you're making to comply with the executive orders and the precautions that you're making to prevent the COVID-19 spread. There are line markers that you need to put. There are still capacity limits that need to be adhered to Next slide. And then there are a whole host of signages instructing customers about their requirement, legal obligations to wear a face com covering, informing customers not to come in if they're sick. Uh, retail space needs to design um, and create store activities that encourages 
that six feet separation that we are all very familiar with now. Next slide. And of course, retail operations need to install physical barriers, enhance cleaning. They need to train their employees on cleaning and how to deal with symptomatic customers upon entry um, and then notify employees of COVID-19. They have heightened notification requirements. And then one thing I just did want to highlight, if you are a retail store, is while others, as Sandy was saying, unless you're a remote worker or you're still exempted from operating, you don't have to operate with minimum staff anymore, just the critical staff or the bare minimum. Um, you can staff your business how you want with those certain exceptions, except again, if you are specifically called out in um, Executive Order 110 or previous executive order. So Executive Order 97, if you're a retail store, you still need to limit your staffing to the minimum number to operate. So that's unique to retail stores there. Next slide. So question number eight um, is one that um, some people are very excited about is, wait, are you actually telling me that it's legal to go out to eat or drink now. And the answer to that is, well, on Monday you can, and of course, with certain exceptions. So uh, in Executive Order 110, there were a whole slew of not just restaurants, but food courts, cafes, coffee houses, microbreweries, bars, wineries, and places of similar um, likeness to those that may be open to the public as follows. So um, they have additional requirements in place. So the first requirement is not really anything new. They can of course still do the delivery service, the window service. There were some nuances with changes in that, but we're all kind of used to, we could order out and pick up and, and things of that nature. But starting Monday, next slide please, is we are actually able to um, go to restaurants and bars for outdoor and indoor seating. And again, if you are a restaurant or a bar owner, you still need to comply with Executive Order 97, Section 1, and Executive Order 97, exec, um, Section 8. And so ex Section 8, is um, provides additional requirements if you are a restaurant or bar, a bar because the governor still sees that industry as being uh, particularly high for uh, spreading COVID-19 if certain measures are not met. So we still, when we saw a couple weeks ago with up north and the Traverse City area opening, we were coveting the fact that those folks could go and sit down and um, grab a burger if they wanted. Um, but there were requirements, those same requirements that were in place up north are required now here throughout the state. So the limit capacity to 50%, you will see when you go out to eat um, that there will be six feet separation um, everywhere. There will be communication materials. You will not be able to um, wait in the waiting area. You will either need to wait in your cars or there'll be other measures um, to adhere to those safety measures um, if there is a 50% capacity and there is um, a line to get a table. Next slide. And if you are a, res a restaurant or a bar, you'll have to close yourself to food or drink options. Um, provide physical guides such as tape on the floor. We've all seen that with retail post signs at entrance informing customers not to come in if they've been sick, instructing customers to wear face coverings until they get to their table, and requiring hosts and servers to wear face coverings in the dining area. Next slide. And then restaurants still have enhanced requirements such as employees wearing face coverings and gloves when they are handling food consistent with the FDA, limit share items for customers so when you get to the table um, there won't be a menu on the table or ketchup and mustard, that type of thing. And then there's enhanced training mechanisms for employees if you're in that industry. 
Next slide. And then restaurants, you need to notify employees if an employer learns of an individual. So this isn't just an employee, it's a customer or supplier that's had COVID-19. You need to close the restaurant immediately upon certain uh, situations and you need to install physical barriers much like we've seen and check out with grocery stores um, where there are areas where six feet of separation just isn't possible. And then to the extent possible, um, the restaurants will need to limit the number of employees in shared spaces such as kitchens and things like that to maintain six feet uh, separation. Next slide. So then question number nine is sort of, and I view this executive order 110, and what I had said before is there's, for a lot of businesses, it's just, it hasn't really, this order has not affected them. You still need to comply with executive order 97, and the remote work still continues. I see this executive order as more of a personal liberty freedom, that there, it's more of a relaxing of what individuals can do, not so much a relaxing of what employers can do. And in fact, there is no relaxation of any of the safety requirements or, or that sort of thing. It's just um, more of a freedom of, as Sandy mentioned, we don't need to, we don't, we're not under an order that says stay home. We're under an order of you can go out, except if you do this. So what can we do now? Um, what can, I legally do for fun. So uh, in prior executive order uh, 96, um, which of course is rescinded, but even under executive order 96, we could go outside, but otherwise we were limited to social gatherings in or outside to 10 or less that weren't in the same household. That still continues. So if we're having a party indoors, and it's for friends, it's still limited to 10 people. But now we can socially gather, we can um, get together with friends and family up to 100, of peop 100 people outside um, as long as certain requirements are met. We can also go to outdoor parks and recreation facilities, public swimming pools are open with certain restrictions, day camps for children, Libraries and museums are open. They must follow, though, that retail store rules that I just quickly went through before. Uh, next slide. Shopping, of course, what we talked about without an appointment, dine-in restaurants, and outdoor fitness classes, athletic practices, training sessions, or games, provided that six-foot separation and subsequent and frequent disinfectant. If there were any, um, I would say, conflicting uh, interpretations of any clause in Executive Order 110, I would say that it's right here. The outdoor fitness classes, athletic practices, um, different organizations and sports, sporting events in, in sports are taking uh, very different viewpoints um, on that. So as you go out and socialize and do recreational, you may be scratching your head on why some organizations are doing certain things and some are not. Uh, next slide. So that all sounds pretty good that we're able to do um, a lot more things, but when socializing or engaging in recreation after 110, do I still need to practice social distancing and other safety measures? So when we're having that party where uh, outside and we can have up to a hundred employ a uh, hundred individuals not in the same household can we greet everyone with with a hug can we um, high five them and do that sort of thing the answer to that is still no next slide is while we can engage in different recreational we must still um, it's still the law to require social distancing so must follow social distancing measures as recommended by the CDC by remaining six feet apart. And we still must wear face coverings and enclose public spaces unless medically unable. So even though there's certainly much, a lot more activities that Michiganders can do, uh, it's still going to be at a distance, or at least that is what the executive order's saying. And with that, um, 
we are concluding our webinar for this morning. I know in our next slide after this, just a refresher reminder of the Back to Work Resource Center um, that has, if you're interested in having a video training, um, I know that Resource Center is, there's training available um, in that, or there are training if you just want the training video, if you're not um, doing it via handout or in person, you can also um, secure that a la carte um, at the Miller Johnson website as well. Um, with that, Sandy, do you have any additional comments before we close um, our webinar? Just one additional comment, um, and this kind of happened. The last time Mary and I did a webinar uh, together, we, we gave our webinar about nuts and bolts about what eventually became Executive Order 97, and later that same day, um, there was an update to that. And so we've just received word uh, that Governor Whitmer has a press conference scheduled today for 11 a.m. So only only comment to say the story continues. So, um, so we'll be on the lookout for that. And um, as you know, we will um, uh, put together uh, information for you and, and have information for you about um, any executive orders that might flow from that press conference that impact our clients. All right. Have a Thank great you, weekend, Sandy. everybody. Yep. Yes. Goodbye.